When he was six, Thomas was sent off to England. A rich uncle, Lord Aylesbury, had thought it prudent to confer the benefits of an English education on his young Scottish nephew. Thomas grew up in an England that was starting to think of itself as one of the great civilizations. Comparisons were being made by patriots with ancient Greece. Dearest mother, this place is very handsome. First we come to an arch of stones, like a rock. Then we come to a cave. There is a dark passage that leads to a central chamber. And prepare yourself. It was a young woman who showed Elgin the way to revive his scheme. Mary Nesbitt was 21, pretty, headstrong, and well-born. Elgin could not keep away from her. She made Elgin happy and rich. Her money and enthusiasm breathed fresh life into his architectural ambitions. 1999 was a joyful year for Lord Elgin for another reason. Soon after the wedding, he was appointed ambassador extraordinary to the Ottoman court in Constantinople. The Ottoman Empire was a huge ramshackle power that stretched across the eastern Mediterranean. In 1799, it was under attack. Napoleon Bonaparte and the French army had just taken a chunk out of it in Egypt. Elgin's mission in Constantinople was to conclude an alliance between the Turkish Sultan and the British Crown against the French. But there was something else. The Turks controlled Athens and with it, access to the sites of classical antiquity. Elgin's mind went back to his estate at Broom Hall. Might it not benefit from the Greek connection? His architect thought so. It was an opportunity, said Harrison, for his lordship to send a team of artists to draw and measure the ancient temples. Precise plans made in Athens would mean beautiful results later in Scotland. The two men had talked themselves into something that would haunt Elgin for the rest of his life. was a hard journey. The Mediterranean was a war zone, and the captain of the frigate eager for action. Lady Elgin stayed below deck, two months pregnant and constantly sick. For her, it was three months of discomfort and distress. And then, Constantinople, gateway to the east. We arrived here yesterday evening, and I don't suppose any creature was ever more grateful for being at their journey's end. The entrance to this place surpasses all my expectations. 
I found a fine gilt chair with six men to carry it waiting my arrival. If Elgin was to have success in Athens, it would be important to charm the despot. Selim's palace was off limits to foreign women, but this didn't deter Mary Elgin. The willful ambassador's wife accompanied her husband disguised as Lord Bruce. Together, they took their chances. The audience was a success. For Elgin, it opened the first door to Athens. What had been the capital of the ancient world was, in 1800, the 43rd city of the Ottoman Empire, a Turkish garrison town. Below the Acropolis was a maze of streets. Within its walls were a mosque, a barracks, and a harem. This is where Lord Elgin had sent his artists. They were led by Giovanni Battista Lucieri, a landscape painter from Naples. Talented, it was said, but cheap enough for Elgin to afford. With Lucieri were the craftsmen, the molders, the architects. They were to sketch the Acropolis, make casts, and take measurements. Two and a half thousand years old when Elgin's men got there, the temples were a triumph of survival over human indifference. A hundred years before, the Acropolis had been shelled by a besieging Venetian army. The debris was being used by the Turkish soldiers to build their barracks. The temple had become a kind of quarry. In charge of the Acropolis was the Turkish military governor, the Dizdar. To get past him, foreigners needed a special permit, a firman. Elgin's artists didn't have one. But the Dizdar was not above a bribe, and he liked the idea of having his portrait taken. As Lucieri sketched the Turk, his colleagues climbed up to the citadel with their scaffolding. And this was critical. 
for the artist needed to get above the Turkish houses in order to get close to the details on the temples. But in allowing the men to inspect the temples, the scaffolding had also invited them to inspect the harems. <laughs> that was a problem. And not one solvable by a bribe. The Dizdar threw the foreigners off the citadel. There would be no further access to the Acropolis and the marbles without the permission of the Sultan. Lord Elgin, already weak from the heat, fell into a fever. Dearest mother, he has been ill with rheumatism of the head for three days past. Dr. McLean made him put leeches on his temples last night, which I hoped would relieve him, but I am sorry to say he is still in great agony about the head. McLean says he never saw such leeches in his life. They bite much more than in England. Elgin was sick and demoralized. His project in Athens apparently at an end. Without the Sultan's permit or firman, Elgin's dream in Athens was over. But then the warriors did what the diplomat could not do. The British army had landed in Egypt and joining forces with the Turks had driven the French out of the country.
British and the ambassador extraordinary Lord Elgin were the most popular people in town. Elgin shook off his sickness and seized the moment. He wrote to the Sultan for the Furman. Three weeks later, an extraordinary document arrived at the British Embassy. It was from the palace. Permission was being given to Elgin to erect scaffolding within the Acropolis, to excavate and take casts. And an additional, unasked-for privilege seemed to have been given. No one should meddle with their scaffolding, read the English translation nor hinder them from taking away any pieces of stone. Qualche pezzi di pietra, the words have become famous. Some pieces of stone. Any? A few? On the evening of the 23rd of July, 1801, Lucieri and the artists went up to the Acropolis with the permit. And before them, for the first time, Within touching distance, the great works of the genius Phidias, ancient and impossibly beautiful. And then Elgin's men looked to the Parthenon itself, to the metopes on the building, directly beneath the cornice. A solid block of marble was chosen, two tons, 40 feet above ground. Was it possible to detach it? The idea was audacious, its repercussions breathtaking. If it were possible to remove one metope, it was possible to remove all of them. 30 laborers, Greeks, had been hired by Lucieri and the ship's winching gear pressed into service. Saws arrived from Constantinople. And the operation to remove the first marble from the Parthenon began. <laughs> Yeah. 
seemed a vital one. The Turkish soldiers were now making mortar by taking marble from the Parthenon itself. Lucieri was horrified. It was now, he thought, a race between the infidels and the artists. I am sure that in half a century there will not remain one stone on top of another. It would be very well, my lord, to ask for all that is left, or else do all that is possible to prevent their going on in this fashion. Elgin was delighted by the test, though alarmed by the report of Turkish destruction. And there was something else he had just learned that Lucieri could not know. It concerned Napoleon. Although the French army had been vanquished from Egypt, it now appeared that 80 engineers had remained and they were at work dismantling and removing Egyptian antiquities. What was happening outside Cairo might soon happen in Athens. Elgin was tormented by two dreadful thoughts. The precious marbles could be ground to mortar by the Turks or stolen by the French. New instructions were sent to Lucieri in Athens. More was to be taken, and quicker. By the end of the summer, Elgin had 300 men dismantling the Acropolis. As the demands from Constantinople increased, the work in Athens became more frantic. More was risked. As Lord Elgin's men were gaining more marble in Athens, he was losing his wife to Constantinople. Leaving the self-enclosed world of the European embassies, Lady Elgin began to explore the qualities of the Ottoman court. It was a world away from Scotland. Maltese slaves, black eunuchs, and Persian troubadours. She was befriended by the ladies of the harem, who dressed the Scottish noblewoman like themselves. Dearest mother, I never knew what politeness was until I met the Turks. I have an audience at the palace, which of course I accepted, though I really dread it. For we must be up at four in the morning and remain there six hours to eat breakfast. As the ambassador's wife threw herself into Constantinople, the ambassador withdrew further into his Athenian obsession. Elgin's eye was now fixed on the ultimate prize, the Caryatids, the female figures that supported the Erechtheum. The Greeks believed that these graceful goddesses, modeled on the maidens from the city of Caria, were more than just statues. They were real women, enchanted into stone by magicians. At Elgin's request, the best statue was taken and replaced with rough brick. It was soon adorned with spiteful graffiti. What the Goths here did not do was done by a Scot. At the end of the working day, the artist would stay on the Acropolis and continue to draw the temples. 
he soon realized he was being watched. Lucieri was sure it was an omen. The owl was the symbol of Athena, the goddess of the ancient temples. Athena who was wise and vengeful. Jealous, perhaps, of the marble that was now in Elgin's possession. Lord Elgin was now needed in Athens, and he was anxious to get there. On the 2nd of April, 1802, Lord and Lady Elgin arrived in Athens for the first time. They were eager to see the fruits of 18 months collecting. His men had done their job well, and the priority now was to ship their haul back to London. Lord Elgin returned to Constantinople, leaving Lady Elgin in Athens to supervise the shipment. It was a cumbersome process, and time was short. Reports were coming in that the French Navy was gathering off the coast of Greece. And several rumors had it that the French had already landed on the peninsula. It was vital to get the precious cargo out of Greece quickly. The Greek workers were uneasy about their part in the removal of the marbles. On the road to Piraeus, their fears were confirmed. Inside the wagon was the last of the metals. It belonged to the goddess Athena. Athena the sea was Athena at war. sound was a warning, but Elgin was not there to listen. In Piraeus, there was now a problem. Few English naval captains wanted to be weighed down by such a heavy cargo, not with the French around. But Lady Elgin could be very persuasive. I am now satisfied of what I always thought, which is how much more women can do if they set about it than men. I will lay a bet that had you been here, you would not have got half as much on board as I have. Do you love me better for it, Elgin? Within an hour of leaving Piraeus, storm clouds had gathered. The tiny brig, weighed down by its heavy cargo, was swept headlong towards the rocky island of Sariga. The captain made a desperate effort to enter the harbor.
At last, after four years of grief and disappointment, a ship from the Royal Navy's Mediterranean fleet brought the marbles back to England. His dreams of a Greek revival in England could still happen. The public would demand it. To make sure they did, Elgin organized a boxing match that would allow spectators to compare forms ancient and modern. Fashionable London came to admire the pugilists trading blows amidst the marble. Elgin's show was a typical gamble. Either he'd be knocked out or the public would. The boxing match was a resounding success, and soon the little museum was packed with Londoners marvelling at the glory of Athens. While the society of the dilettanti was so confused by the sculpture's apparent modernity that they pronounced them fakes. You have lost your labour, my lord. Your marbles are overrated. They are not Greek. They are Roman, of the time of Hadrian. <laughs> 